Well, the, the, uh, the focus of my talk will be on what some of the uh, science and uh, technology and, uh, and electronic developments that were done in the early 1960s at Queen's. And the Queen's Radio Observatory existed back in the, into, into the past, into the mid-50s. That's when it was begun by George Harrower and Bob Chisholm, basically. Also, Jack Hogarth of the Mathematics Department at Queen's. It was a three-department effort. Uh, the Radio Astronomy Group, it was called. And uh, it, uh, it had a very impressive number of good students uh, who did uh, master's and PhD projects with the Queen's University Observatory. And uh, um, a great pity is that it, was, it has been, in some contexts, lost in history because uh, of its short life. And the reason for the short life, I think, was because um, uh, the two principals, George Harrower and uh, Bob Chisholm, uh, went different, well, had different fates. Uh, Bob Chisholm, in the mid-1960s, in the late 1960s, died suddenly of a heart attack at the age of 38. And um, George Harrower, around that time, we, uh, and around that means 1964 or so, uh, decided to change careers, and he became vice dean of arts and science at Queen's, and then vice principal uh, at Queen's, and then president of Lakehead University by 1970-something. Uh, so uh, you can see that the two leaders departing had a, had a really big impact, and, and there was not really the impetus for various other historical reasons to carry on. So uh, I've sent around this sheet. Um, the top part, of, top half of which uh, just gives some background to the history, and uh, the final two paragraphs are going to are describing what I'm going to talk about mostly today. So uh, this is the same uh, abstract that you have. I hope a copy of. There's still a few more copies up there. If, if they're, we're missing some. Um, this is uh, a run over of some of the instruments, some of the telescopes, radio telescopes, that were built at the Queen's Radio Observatory, about 20 kilometers to the west of Kingston. Um, this is uh, uh, an array built by Bob Chisholm, and I believe George Aiken, although I don't really know the, uh, the detailed history. It's, it's a, a, a variation of a Mills cross. Um, and uh, this is an east-west array of dipoles at 850-odd megahertz. Um, and I, I believe that this was used later on as, a, as the base for a much more visible uh, uh, and dense array of uh, Yagis that I'm, I'm sure that Joe Joseph will talk about, or somebody else, probably Dick, Dick Butler. Uh, anyway, so that's just uh, one of the instruments. And you can see a close-up here of the east-west array with the reflecting panel. And then if you peek underneath that aluminum panel, you'll see uh, some very sophisticated waveguide uh, transmission uh, gear. Another project, and, this, and I'm just giving you highlights of some of them. That there were several projects at the Queen's Radio Observatory. Uh, this was an attempt uh, in the context of experimenting with arrays at low frequencies to see if you could simulate the effect of a paraboloid by having uh, resonance scatterers put on poles at random positions on the ground. And then uh, the signal will be, to some extent, collected at the focus, which was at the top of that tower. I wasn't involved with that, but it was going on about the same time. And some, other, uh, some others here can say more about it. Um, another very important. Uh, aspect of the Queen's uh, observatory was ionospheric physics research. And uh, this, and this was also a major activity, as you've already gathered, um, in Canada. And this is really where, the, where radio astronomy, at least in the university communities, and in part from NRC, came from. Um, the idea was to, um, was to understand the uh, anomalies in the ionosphere uh, as they drifted overhead. And you could do this. Uh, of course, you could do it by, by radar, as was done by, uh, by the Arecibo telescope uh, around that time. Uh, you could do that by uh, having banks of Yagi 
arrays separated by up to a few kilometers. And um, looking at Cassiopeia A as it went overhead, and uh, from the scintillations of the uh, signal caused by the ionospheric lumps and clouds, you could, you could measure the, si the scale and densities and so on of these uh, ionospheric clouds as they drifted across. They were typically a couple or three kilometers in size and um, uh, were nicely visible down around 80 megahertz in, in scintillation. Uh, this is uh, part of John McDougall's, another graduate student who did his PhD at Queen's, uh, his uh, project. And he had banks of these at, at different locations set up around in the area. Um, now I'll move to uh, my array. Um, George Harrower, uh, who was the inspiration of many things at Queen's University Observatory, and who incidentally, uh, unfortunately, died just two years ago at the age of about 90 or so, uh, having retired to uh, Amherst Island near, near Kingston. Um, he, he suggested the project. And uh, the idea was to see if we could, uh, we, could, we could develop further some of the arrays that were built at Cambridge, uh, also in the early uh, 1960s by Riles Group. And uh, so this is a test bed. And this is where I started. And I didn't realize until I got into this that I was in for a really major task if I was going to make, build an array of which this is just a little segment, a test segment and then uh, d design all of the electronics and the signal processing, and then get a thesis done, a master's thesis in two years. And I was very worried at the time, uh, uh, particularly because I looked around the physics department and, and uh, some other places and noticed master's students were sitting there for five years, six years, seven years. And these were mostly in nuclear physics, by the way. Um, and still grinding away in their thesis, and, and some very clever people. And I had the later, I've had the impression that some of these people were, you know, they, they spent their a lot of their early year, career energy just doing a master's project, uh, which was really a waste of talent, in my opinion. That's my editorial comment. Um, anyway, so I was determined not to get into that camp, uh, since I saw it from the beginning. Well, this is, a, this is just a test segment, a, a corner reflector, uh, and what size of mesh, and what material could I use, and what angle should I use for the corner reflector. And then I had to uh, understand the impedance properties, of the impedance of the, of the folded dipole, which I put in here, which was going to be the antenna. And this was going to grow into an east-west array, um, about um, 100 and 13 meters long in the end, as we'll see shortly. Anyway, this is on the roof of the Civil Engineering Building and right beside the Queen's University Observatory, uh, the new one at the time. OK, so uh, let's proceed. And uh, well, maybe I'll just say that the uh, what might seem like unimportant things to, uh, to consider were quite important if you consider the weather around Kingston. For example, there were ice storms and snowstorms in the winter. And this had to survive several seasons. Um, and the question is, would a mesh like this uh, do? Well, the answer is it wouldn't. It was too fine. Uh, so uh, that was one lesson, that, well, not, not from real experience, but just by thinking about it. So um, uh, down on the far right-hand corner, you'll see the mesh that I actually picked. It was a 2 by 2 inch galvanized steel mesh. And the, it shouldn't be too springy because you know it's difficult to work with, and it shouldn't be too uh, malleable because you know if you threw a baseball at it, it would make a dent and it'd be hard to get it out. So this turned out to be a very nice kind of mesh. And here is the here is the frame, and I'm in the process of assembling a frame, which is just Dexian's Dexian um, boundary and uh, two by threes, and the mesh is stapled onto the wood, and. Uh, that's, that's how it went. And the concept was, and I built this be, intending to build something that would last. And I, thanks to George Harrower, I had almost unlimited uh, ability to choose suppliers and labor and everything else to make something really substantial. The, only, the, less, the least substantial part were these reflector panels, but they could be easily replaced, so they were just bolted together. 
So um, uh, the concept seemed to work. This is um, a, a civil engineering student, Larry Windover, is his name, a third year, who is a third year summer student working for me. And uh, he, was the, uh, he was the consultant and expert on the foundations. And here's the here are the foundations beginning to be laid. Um, and uh, Larry was a very talented person, I must say. And we'll come back to him, some of his work later on. And there we are, pouring the, con the foundations. Uh, and this was done usually early in the morning. And if you had a, uh, you know, if you had a, a employment office labor that you were, which I got from the Kingston City, uh, um, City Hall, um, uh, you had to be sure that they appeared in time for the concrete mixer. Uh, you, just a, a case, uh, you know, a sample of the, of the practical problems you you encounter when you go into something like this. Um, so here is the array being built, and you can now see the foundations, and you can see how it works. Uh, to my eye, it's not a 60-degree corner reflector, but maybe it really is. I'm not sure. I was puzzled about that, and I asked Roland if, what, if he could, if, I, if there's something wrong. Maybe there isn't. And these are just some quick uh, pictures again. I'll flip over them, but I'm going to stop on this one because um, here we have George Harover with me, and... Um, we're um, just, uh, well, it's about, the, it's about the same time as the previous two pictures, uh, but it will show you that the, um, the um, layout is a T in which the, there's a moving segment, segment of the same array uh, that goes um, perpendicular, which is north-south, and you can see some of the beginnings of this uh, north-south uh, array. And we'll just look at the follow the development a little bit further. Here, is the, uh, here are the foundations for the north-south array, and that's going to be the receiver hut. And uh, uh, then again, you, you can see the east-west array, which is, as I said, just under 400 feet long. And uh, this is a, this, uh, a moving array, of which that's the base uh, frame. It was going to be about 50 feet in length. Is that right? Going to be four segments anyway, um, and um, this is just a little bit more of a close-up uh, at, at a more finished state. You can see the antennas and how they're mounted. They're mounted with a wooden on wooden trusses, and uh, you can see now the the north-south track already complete here. Um, another set of foundations, and I one nice thing was that we were building this on bedrock, on limestone bedrock. You didn't have to go too far to get to the bedrock. In some places, the bedrock was so close to the surface that we could actually pour the concrete right onto limestone bedrock, which is, of course, an advantage. How am I doing? This is another close-up. Uh, the, the feed system was with a foam, foam cord twin lead cable. Um, 300 ohm cable, and um, this is the uh, point at which the uh, this was a junction point. And you can see a ballon there, uh, and there is another picture of the track being built. Now the track was interesting too because it, its length was such that this is about 60 meters. Uh, the length was such that um, uh, with long pieces of steel that we used. Uh, you had to think about expansion because we had a 70 degrees Celsius span in temperature from winter to summer. Um, and uh, uh, to avoid buckling, which was, would, have been, would have happened, the, uh, the long pieces were anchored at one end, um, and then at, at the other end, now this doesn't show it well because I, it was the other way around, uh, but at the other end, the, the bolts were, were, um, uh, were uh, set with slots so that the expansion, one end was tied, the other end moved with slots. And that worked beautifully. And it went through several seasons until finally it was uh, scavenged by people after the, when the observatory started to, to decline and disappeared. Anyway, that's just another example of some of the technical uh, issues that I had to face. And Larry Windover was a great uh, help in all, in all of this with his civil engineering experience. And here is the north-south array, the, the, that bed that supports it being welded up. And it's, it's uh, stiffened by a cantilever structure. And this, is a, this, is going to be, this is going to be up like this, just like on a bridge. 
and there are four cantilever uh, sections uh, to uh, keep it nice and stiff. And uh, the other idea was that um, rolling friction had, had to be minimized because I was the one who had to move the antenna in the variable spacing uh, uh, scenario to get, the to get the Fourier components for the synthesis observations. And uh, it had to move, be able to move also in winter when there was snow and ice on the tracks and you know, guess, you know. So uh, um, that's why we decided on a, uh, on, on a 90 degree angle beams as the tracks with, a, with a, just a, a narrow ridge at the top. And um, the, the ridge was, uh, the ridge was, the, it was a 90 degree sort of ridge. And then the wheels that ran on it um, were um, lubricated with brass bushings. And the interior of the wheel, that is the, the wheel part, had an angle which was just a bit bigger than 90 degrees. So that you can imagine it would roll right, nice, right nicely on the, right on the apex with, and in fact, it worked beautifully. No, you know, I could move the whole thing. Of course, the wind could move it too. That was another matter. <laughs> and then this, is, this just shows a little more of the detail. You can see the numbering on the tracks to, so I, in meters to see where, where you were. And there's the, uh, there's a, the track with the moving uh, section on it and just another view of it. And that's the receiver hut, which we'll see uh, later. And this is just another, another picture. And I'll walk through some of the uh, uh, technical, further technical features of the, uh, of the array. That's, that's one of my sisters there, I think. Um, that's Barbara. And um, this is the receiver hut. And uh, you know, again, temperature extremes from winter to summer, uh, going down to minus 30 Celsius in, this, in the winter, and then plus 70, well, not, not, not plus 40. But, um, uh, but for the tracks, it was, a, it was a bigger issue, because the tracks, of course, would get very hot in the sun. So you, you had to, that's why I said 70 degrees Celsius temperatures. Man. Anyway, here's the receiver hut. And that had to be temperature controlled. And it wasn't, didn't have a very big volume to temperature control over that range. So I, uh, I, got a, I decided on a heat pump to do, that would hopefully do the whole job, winter and summer. It would heat and cool. And that worked fine, too. There we had a very stable receiver, and temperature stability was very good. And this is just another, I'm showing so many of these pictures because uh, it's disappeared from not only from, from physically, but from uh, the memory of so many people, or even the knowledge of many people. Even, even the graduate students at Queens who were there a year or two later, I know one example. I think it's Bob Hayward, <laughs> who didn't even know about it. And he was a graduate student at Queens. So um, there we go. And this is the back of the receiver. Uh, of course, in those days, this was the um, uh, early 60s, everything was in tubes, thermionic valves, uh, no, tra no transistors in anything that I built. And this is the front part of the receiver. There is the charge recorder, where the output was, of course, recorded. Um, and then um, I'm jumping ahead here to, uh, to uh, the signal processing at the, at the end. Um, the, I, had, um, I, I decided that I would use, um, that I, over the length of the track, I would uh, accumulate 20 Fourier components to synthesize the sky distribution. And that, that was uh, what you needed to have. And um, so this uh, bit of output, which is on punch cards, as you can see, had the cosine and the sine components and the right ascension slice, because it was a, it was a fan beam. The big array made a fan beam north-south. And the moving array cut the fan beam into the higher resolution elements by Fourier transforming it. And then the coefficient order. So that was the format of the output, quite simple. Um, and this is this was written in Fortran 2. Uh, if anyone remembers Fortran 2, it was UTO Fortran called that back in those days, and that was my code. Um, and here we are looking at some of the output uh, on that chart recorder which you saw. Uh, this is I've just taken two uh, samples. This is the cosine component of the fifth order Fourier component on going moving along the track. And then the cosine of the eighth Fourier component. 
And uh, this has torus A. There's torus A. And remember, this is not a total power drift. This is, a, this is the interferometer uh, correlation. So that's why you see things going positive and negative. Uh, Cygnus A was, went off scale, as you might guess. And you have to realize that this uh, record was for a, uh, if you do a total power record, or if you're doing just one component, uh, you're not seeing the full gain of the telescope. You only see the full gain when you've done the Fourier synthesis and made your map. So uh, to give you an idea of the signal to noise we had in this system, uh, this is pretty good for Taurus. That's just a one on one component. And of course, Cygnus A is, is another story. It was already off scale. Um, the system was, so, was sensitive enough that uh, it could see interference, which of course was not the nicest thing. And I can remember during times of uh, an ionospheric anomalies, picking up taxi calls from New Orleans <laughs> on, my, on my audio monitor. How did you know it was taxi calls? Oh, because you could hear it. <laughs> you could hear the conversations. <laughs> Had a little audio, audio monitor in the, in the receiver shed. Um, anyway, fortunately, that was a rarity. And uh, the ionosphere was normally very well behaved. Um, and uh, that's an interesting question, because what frequency should I choose for the array? This is go back to the very beginning. Uh, well, if I picked the two meter ham band, I could buy off the shelf mixers and lots of off the shelf stuff. So that was what drove 146 meter, megahertz. It's right in the middle of the two meter ham band. But assuming that you know, the hams weren't too, were too active, otherwise I'd be bombed out for the whole thesis. Well, it turns out we did very well. It was very little in interference, uh, except on a few anomalous occasions. And of course, the, uh, the 60 degree corner reflector was also helpful, that angle, in screening out you know, stuff around the horizon from the antennas. And what have we got here? This is the upper transit of Taurus, again. And this is the uh, same for Cassiopeia. I won't spend more time on that. And um, this one is not an interferometer record. It's a total power drift using just the east-west array. So imagine this one degree fan beam, one degree wide, 40 degrees uh, north to south. And um, again, you can, you can imagine, uh, 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 since, since you're diluting the, the uh, brightness temperature sensitivity by a factor of 40, or something like that, then uh, the signal th was just enormous for this system. And it's also illustrated by the fact that if you do a total power drift scan, which is what this shows, um, uh, this is the galaxy, the galactic plane coming through, starting with some off, off uh, galaxy level. And these, this is all real signal and stuff in the galaxy. Um, and there's Cygnus A. And this is a, a coma lobe uh, of Cygnus A, because I had one. In, in, the, in the tree of connections of the 96 antennas, uh, there was one reverse polarity uh, connection. And that made the coma lobe. But it was too late to go on back and fix that. I remember my time frame that I had in mind that I wasn't going to spend years going and redoing things. So I just carried on. In fact, nowadays, we could, if we reprocess this, we could remove that. So uh, it, uh, not a big deal in the end. But it did worry me greatly, and I just pressed on. Um, and here we are with the output. This is the first Fourier synthesis map. Uh, this is from RA 15 to 20 hours, and deck 5 to 44 degrees. Uh, and uh, this is 5 degrees. That's 5, and that's 44. And um, I'll d I just need to s pause a minute or two to uh, explain this in more detail. Um, the, the computer program that you saw, that Fortran code, corrected for the primary beam of the, uh, the north-south primary beam of the array. Uh, and it also put in a, a, a taper. I used a sine z over z taper just to, give it, to make the beam, synthesized beam a little cleaner. And the taper could go in and out and could be changed. The, the code allowed for all of that. But I, I had to take a, a polar diagram, north-south polar diagram, from a textbook probably from John Krauss. And, um, and of course, the real polar diagram uh, of, the, of that V is, was not quite the same. Um, and so uh, the corrections were, were, were wrong. They were, uh, they were overestimated. And that's why you see the, the, the 
at the edges of the, of the, uh, of the, of the beam, of this 40 degree beam, you see the signal going way up. And that, that's purely a matter of, uh, you know, obviously a matter of, of normalization and correction and could be easily done now. Um, also, you can see that in, in this part of the sky, uh, there is a dominant harmonic, which was uh, a gain error that crept in somewhere. Maybe it was a mistyped IBM card uh, that went into the input and made a harmonic that was over-dominant. Again, that's easily correctable post facto. But you can see the galactic plane coming in here. This is, as you march along in right ascension towards 20 hours, you can see the galactic plane, just not the best representation. And then Cygnus A is, is, comes in here as well at deck 40, which is something around here. That, this is Cygnus A or its, or its effect. So, um, and then here's a contour map of the same thing. Uh, of course, drawn by hand in, in, in these cases. And um, if you go back to here, what you can guess what it is. These are charts off the recorder that you saw out at West, Westbrook. And I just uh, cut, the, cut the signal out and put, put it on a piece of uh, cardboard and then put, it, put them in slots in a wooden box, which the uh, machine shop at uh, the physics department at Queen's made for me. Well, that's, that's another shot of the uh, uh, finished array. And uh, this is the, uh, the, the random, uh, the attempt at random scatterers that you might hear more about. Uh, one of several projects, I might add, that were going on at the time. In fact, we had about, when I was there, we had six, seven, eight graduate students in, that, in those early 60s doing ionospheric and uh, astronomy. And, and, doing, and by astronomy, I mean, uh, experiments of antenna arise, arrays, bearing in mind we're going back to the early 60s here when radio telescopes were barely built. This telescope was built at the same time as this one here, by the way, just about, well, a, a year or two later, just to put you back in the, in the right time frame. Uh -huh. So it was Canada's other functioning you know, major telescope. And that's just a picture of me with the moving array. You can see, you can see the markings and the meter markings. This tower was for another experiment, and I, it was unrelated. Uh, and that's just another picture of the array. And we had a student uh, who, was, who was our institute photographer. Uh, and uh, his name was Flynn Marr. He, he took pictures for the uh, Queen's Journal newspaper as a sort of uh, uh, hobby. Uh, activity, and he took this on infrared film. So th this is the grass in infrared. <laughs> now that was a nice picture. Nice sky as well. Yeah. Now I'm going to move to, uh, le let me just stop there for a sec before I go on to the next slide and I'll, I'm going to change topics. And as, as I think I said, uh, we're only looking at, a, I'm only showing a, a few samples in my talk, but we'll hear more, of the experiments and, and devices that were developed at the Queen's Radio Observatory at that time. And um, I'm now going to go back before my time. I came in 61 September, and I left in 63 um, July. So it was just under two years that I was there. And my thesis was submitted uh, in, um, in July, no, June of 63. That's right. Uh, so um, there's rather a small window of time, even though the Queen's Radio, Radio Observatory only went for about 15 years total. Um, so let's go back to before my time, from what I, something I can talk about because I've been told in good enough detail. Um, Two experiments. One, uh, the main one I'm going to mention is that of Dave Hogg, David Hogg, who is subsequently uh, uh, the um, site director at Greenbank and uh, was at NR spent his career at NRAO and still lives in Charlottesville or nearby. And um, Dave's mother, by the way, is Helen Sawyer Hogg, and his father was the <coughs> was the um, director of the David Dunlap Observatory. So. Um, uh, David was given another project. He was given his project also by George Harrower, 
And this is, this is with about 1956 or 57, and I might be corrected by someone uh, about the, on the exact date, because, but he was before me. He, he had finished well before I came on the scene. And uh, Dave uh, Hogg was, um, I said how the Dave Hogg suggested this idea, f following in the, you know, in the pattern of what some things that Cambridge had developed, Martin Riles group. Um, Dave Hogg was um, uh, told that he should, he should try and complement some of Art Covington's work on solar astronomy uh, by looking at solar microbursts, which is, which is very much in its infancy, this kind of observation, from type two bursts. You saw type two, two bursts nicely in Henry Branford's talk. Uh, so that was the first inspiration. And uh, here is the receiver. And uh, just look at the top half for the moment. This is the, uh, the oscilloscope with, which recorded the images of the, micro, of, the of the solar radiation. And then this was a recording camera system. And over here, we have the drive, because it was a, this, it, this was the drive for the uh, polar axis mount, which every optical astronomer will recognize. Um, and um, then, here, I'm sorry? Do you know that model? Yeah. <laughs> OK. <laughs> we had lots of those, or similar ones. Anyway, this is Dave Hogg's very impressive helical tracking solar um, burst telescope. Uh, it was, um, well, I don't know how that question mark, someone didn't interpret it my symbol in your, anyway. Six meters long, or, or so. I think it was a little over six meters. A nine-turn helix. Uh, the, this is a three meter diameter reflector at the bottom, and the whole thing was mounted seven meters above the ground. And you can see tie lines here to hold, you know, to hold the top and bottom end in position when it wasn't actually tracking. Um, and he swept be over the FM band, four seconds in time it took to, take, to sweep over the FM frequency band. And the output was recorded on film. And this was Dave Hogg's MSC thesis, a very nice piece of work. And again, this has been forgotten. Uh, Completely. In fact, I didn't even know about this when I was at Queen's. Uh, but I've talked to Dave Hogg, and I talked to him most recently a few weeks ago, and I had this photograph of his uh, enhanced, photo enhanced, um, to make it uh, nicely visible by an, actually a, an NRC physicist retiree who was one of my in laws, father in law of my son. Anyway, so that, is, uh, that was the end of Queen's for me. And uh, this is one of Dick Butler's photographs, uh, as I, which I happily got from him just recently. Thanks to Dick. Um, and then the next stage was something different, but it was also interferometry. And that was my next project, which of course I'm not going to do. But I spent the next uh, five to seven years working with this instrument. And I, I hooked it up as an interferometer for the first time as my PhD thesis uh, project, plus a lot of observations. And that's it. Thank you very much. Yeah, I'm sorry that Dave is not here. He, he, I was hoping he would come. But that's even more of an impressive achievement to, to have a telescope like that and, and be able to observe my tubers. Right, right. Well, he didn't observe very many. The idea was to search for them, you know, to search for microbursts. And it, I don't think there was a good handle on how, how well he would do in the search. And he said, he, de he told me he detected some. But this was over the period of his, you know, a few months probably. So, uh, and unfortunately, I don't have any records from him. But uh, Dave will be a good source of information, I'm sure, uh, for further. Uh, the best thing I could do is to, was to photo enhance his, his, his picture so that we could see what it actually looked like. Is that right? If he had patented it, it would have been. 
Aha. Because the millions of helical antennas are being used for TV reception. Aha. Uh -huh. Right, right. Fascinating. That's interesting. Okay. I, I didn't know that. A story there because we had to go to Green Bank to do polarization calibration for Zamox splitting. And I asked, what sort of helix do you have? I triple E left or right? And they said, we don't know uh, because it was inside a canister. So we had to bring some that we made here in the suitcase. And they really didn't like that at the PSA meeting to have these big helical antennas. So I was reading about how to make a helical antenna in Krauss's book on antennas, chapter five, I think. And the first thing he says is, uh, I invented the helical antenna one day when I went to a colloquium in the physics department. And somebody was talking about uh, making a, an antenna Helix. And I went up to him and I said, do you think this could work as an antenna in radio observations? And the man said with great certainty, no. And he said, I had to go home and try. He went home and tried and he invented the helical. Yeah, but he proved the story further in the big years. He thought the radiation was going to come off the broadside. Uh -huh. yeah, the, the question of, uh, of uh, which handedness you're observing has, has been a long standing one over many experiments o over the years. And I know at Jodrell Bank, the interferometer I showed had helical, uh, it didn't have helical, but it had right and left circular antennas. And uh, so you, you had to know which was right and which was left. Yeah. And, and this was uh, a non trivial task at the time. Once we got it set up and there were several arguments, and finally, only after that did we find out what we were observing, which hand. <laughs> it's still not trivial. We get it right off. Krauss was a nuclear physicist. Uh-huh. His doctorate was in nuclear physics. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's interesting. I, I came to Queens from nuclear physics, too. I was at Chalk River before. <laughs> uh-huh. That's interesting. Uh-huh. Yeah. So judging by the picture, you had strip chart recording. Yeah. You had to digitize it by hand? Uh, yes, that's right. Well, just read, read off the chart. That's right. Digit and punch, punch the numbers onto IBM cards. Yeah, that's what I did. You were the other way with it. I was, that's right. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what do you have? Uh, this, this is a, an aside. You mentioned microbursts. Burst. It made me think about bursts. Uh, Arthur Covington found sky bursts. Uh -huh. He wrote uh, two or three papers, and it's still not clear what he was seeing. Uh, so, uh, this is, I, I don't know. Huh. Check it out. Uh, it, it could be something of interest for modern radio astronomy. It's a sky burst, he called it. Hmm. Any other yes. Wasn't the Hellfield a 60 or 80 foot paraboloid? That came after my time. That was one of the, another of the many instruments that were built at the Queen. That was Vic Hughes, I believe, who made that. And he came after, uh, soon after I left. When Harrower w moved up in the university ranks, then his position, his, his professorship, was filled by Vic Hughes, who came from England. And so I didn't have any overlap with, with Vic Hughes. Although, I'll tell you this, uh, uh, since you raised Vic, uh, this, uh, there's a history of astronomy at Queen's that you can find on the web. And I ch consulted it in the course of preparing this talk. And it was written by Vic Hughes. And uh, it was mostly about the, the Queen's optical telescope starting in 1841 or whatever. Uh, anyway, there's, there's a one-liner somewhere near the end that e even Fourier, synth Fourier <coughs> aperture synthesis was attempted at Queen's, he said. <laughs> and he came after I left. After <laughs> uh, yes. I'm, I'm really interested in this. I never heard of it before because uh, my PhD thesis, Sudan 2, was on the 3C synthesis antenna, which is very similar to yours, I guess. Yep. Mm -hmm. We were working at 178 megahertz. Right, I know. Which was the reject Welsh television frequency, apparently. I see, um, OK. And, and the, the thing, several things, that, I mean, one of the things that's amazing is you talk about the enormous summer to winter, winter temperature difference you have. Yep. And I think back to Cambridge, and I try to remember if we actually had a winter to summer. <laughs> right. Well, a few degrees. Yes. Certainly, you know, you went hunting in the Right. Well, having lived, really having lived in England for about seven years, I yeah. appreciate that. Yeah. We had a much less, uh, and we did digitize all the data at, uh, when we were doing it. That was all automatically digitized. Okay. Mm -hmm. But uh, the synthesis program 
Mm -hmm. And Ham was the expert on this, was all written in EDSAC machine code. Oh, yes, EDSAC. We never huh? had Fortran. Uh -huh. You guys were way ahead of us there. Uh -huh. I mean, uh -huh. and yours, <laughs> you use, no, I guess because the 3C, the, the antenna started about the same time as you were working. Yeah, that's right. And uh, even later when I was doing it, it was all in this EDSAC machine code we had to learn. Uh -huh, I remember. 10 was the number, you know, right. pick up a number from <laughs> register. 11. I, I'll, ha I'll tell you that uh, something about the, the uh, data uh, processing that I didn't mention. Uh, to make these, to do the Fourier synthesis and, do, uh, and to write up the code and so on, I had to use the university's central computer, which was a, one of the first um, solid state um, computers built by IBM. It was an IBM 1620 model. And um, it was, um, it, it, meant, it meant that I had the keys to the, uh, computer center at, of, at Queens, and I could spend most of the night there uh, grinding away because I could only do, because memory limitations meant that I could only do uh, parts of that right ascension uh, range at one time in one job. So that, that was a rather interesting flashback. Yeah. They used the whole thing. I mean, you know, we had Anne doing the computing, and uh -huh. I was doing something else, and other people had done the electronics. But uh -huh. You just for a master's thesis. For a master's <laughs> thesis, but I, of course I had I, I had lo I had lots of technical help, like Larry Windover, the, the engineering student with the tracks, and you know. Yeah, and you had somebody else pour the concrete, but I mean. <laughs> 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 yeah. That's quite amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, more questions. More questions. Oh. We still have a more minutes if you have them. Um, all right. Well, let's thank Brilliant. Thank you.